welcome to week three on our study of uh, prayer. Let's just have a, a word of prayer before we talk about prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you because you're always keen uh, to hear from us. Uh, you love us. You want to communicate and talk to us all the time. And so, Lord, we pray as we study this subject together, you'll open up our understanding and cause us to be uh, better at uh, living with you, talking to you, listening to you, hearing what you have to say to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last week I looked at the subject of uh, listening, uh, as far as uh, listening to God, to hear what he has to say to us and what he wants to say to us. I want to deal tonight with hearing. Now you might say, well, is there any difference between listening and hearing? Well, because we use it in the language, we just interchange it. We, uh, we talk about hearing or listening, but there is a, a difference that I want to point out between the two. We said last week that listening was putting ourselves in a position constantly so we would be ready to hear God listening. Uh, hearing is when God is actually speaking and we're hearing what he's saying. That's how I've, how I've differentiated the two. I looked at that story of um, the boy Samuel, remember, when he was taken by his mother to Eli in the temple and uh, God was speaking to him, calling his name. And of course, Samuel knew nothing of listening or hearing the voice of God. So he thought it was Eli. So God must have been speaking in an audible voice. The boy runs to Eli once, twice, and then Eli cottons on, oh, this boy, he must be hearing the voice of God. So he said, when you hear the voice, uh, another time, if, if the voice comes, say, speak, Lord, oh, your servant is listening, listening. He was listening to what God might have to say. It's being open to God continually. Um, we can have ears, but not listen, can't we? We cannot bother. Things going on around us all the time, and we're not listening. But then sometimes we can tune into things and tune other things out. So you could be working, and there could be, I don't know, the radio on, but you don't hear it, because you're busy here. And then all of a sudden you think, oh, it's the radio, so you can tune into it. When we listen to God, it's having an attitude, as it were, a heart and a mind to always be open to God speaking at any time. That's a listening attitude. Being attentive to how he might speak and through whom or through what he might speak. There's something about listening to God it's different from listening to anyone else. I hope you're all listening to me and uh, those online. I hope you're listening to me as well. But listening to God isn't like listening to a person. There's something supernatural about hearing God. If I said, how many have heard God speak to them audibly, there would be few hands that went up. But I, if I said, how many have heard God speaking to them in another way, They'd say, oh yes, I've heard God. Yes, you know, everyone does. But it's a supernatural thing. There's something mystical about the voice of God. God speaking often through what we see. We catch sight of something and God starts to talk to us in our mind about something. Or he might even tell us to look at something or to take notice of something. He speaks all the time through the things that we see. He speaks to the spirit of a person. And when God speaks, you, you sort of know. At first, you might not be sure. But then as you get older and more mature in the Christian faith, you get to know that God is saying something. You've learned. He says, my sheep, they learn to know my voice. At first, they don't know. But then we know his voice. King, king. Um, but we're very cautious. We say, I think God might be saying... I understand that. We're back in both ends, aren't we? Just in case it's not God. But often, we should be more confident than that. Someone once called it God speaking through the cracks. I like that. 
It's like, uh, it, it doesn't speak just straight. He it, it, it almost speaks in a very mystical, roundabout way, often to us. A number of ways, then, that God speaks to us. I want to look at that in this particular section. God speaks through creation. There's this wonderful couple of verses in Psalms. It's in Psalm 19, and it's the first four verses. Listen to this. The heaven declares the glory of God. It, it's making a declaration uh, about God's glory. The skies, it says, proclaims the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. So it's continually God is speaking. Night after night, they display for us knowledge. He says they have no speech. There are no words. No sound is heard from them. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. It's almost like a contradiction. He's declaring stuff, he's proclaiming something, he's pouring forth words, but he doesn't say anything. Absolute nothing. The stars at night, things like that is what he's talking about, isn't he? We look at the stars and we go, oh, it's wonderful. We start talking about God's creation and how marvellous it is. Remember he took Abraham outside I said, look at all the stars. I don't know whether he was talking audibly to Abraham. It seemed in the Old Testament to talk more audibly. He does less of it in the New Testament and for us because we have the Spirit living within us now. We almost like have a receiver to constantly hear God speak. But in the Old Testament, he seemed to be speaking audibly. I don't know whether he did to Abraham or he spoke into his heart and mind. He said, look at all the stars in the sky. He says... That'll be the number of your children. You can't count them. And then he said, look at the sand on the seashore. That'll be your children. Too many for you to number. We look at sunsets and sunrises and we think, oh, isn't that so beautiful? There must be a God. I suppose you said, how can people say there's no God when you look at that? That's ridiculous. Somehow it all fell into place. It all happened. It wasn't designed. It was just an accident after another accident after another accident. Well, I've never created anything beautiful. With six accidents, I've usually created quite a mess, really, must admit. We look at mountains and rivers and we look at the colours of them and just everything, it's exciting. We look at the oceans and the seas where we live here in Hastings. It's like, I only like the sea when it's rough and powerful and doing things. Well, it's just like a, you know, a pond. It's not very exciting because when the power is there and the waves are crashing, it's, it's just amazing. All speak then to us a silent language. God is thundering, as it were, in our souls, speaking so loudly to us about how glorious his creation is. Is God saying, listen to me, when we look at things? Is he calling out to us to listen, to speak to you wherever you are? God also speaks through very ordinary things. When Jesus was on the earth and with his disciples and the others, um, he spoke about the kingdom of God constantly, telling them what the kingdom of God was and what it was to live in the kingdom, preparing us for heaven, how we should live when we all live together in that kingdom. And what he did time after time, he just took ordinary things and he spoke about those things to the people. It was never complicated. It was so simple. Um, he looked at the world around him and said, oh, see that tree? And then he'd go off into some parable or sermon about a tree and the kingdom of God. He spoke about flowers in the field, didn't he? Spoke about vines and trees and snakes and scorpions. Spoke about pearls and women sweeping floors spoke about men fishing and children playing, just loads of stuff, just the natural things that you would look at. And so in that same way, as we just in life go around with our eyes open, God speaks to us 
through things that we see. We see a lady maybe being very kind to her child and then God speaks to us. I remember early days of ministry. There was a lady and she home taught all the children. She had a special way with children. And I saw her this day. She was kneeling down and talking to her child at level face to face. And I thought, that's brilliant. It was like a sermon. It's like, that's what God does, you see. He has to get down on his knees to talk to us. He doesn't talk from lofty heights and bellow down at us. He gets down at eye level. He knows how simple we are, how innocent we are, like this child. And she just simply spoke. On another occasion, what she did, the child come and I was talking to this lady, and the child, like they always do, they just pull them on to, they want an answer quickly, don't they? They just interfere with, you know, or interrupt what, what it is you're saying. And... She, she turned from me, she said, excuse me, and she turned to the child, she said, excuse me, you just have to wait a minute while I finish speaking to Philip and then I'll speak to you. And I thought, I've never seen that before in my life. It was like, these are real people. Children are real people and they have spirits and souls and minds and attitudes and emotions. And she taught me to talk to even children in a way. That's what Jesus did, didn't he? Remember the disciple says, oh, don't bother him, don't bother the master, the children, he sent to push the children away. And he says, no, no, and he picks them up. It says in my verse, and he picks them up in his arms, and he's looking at them, you see, straight in the face, and he talks to them as real people. Mm. We can learn a lot. God can speak a lot just by the things that we see. Perhaps he never lets opportunities pass by. We don't notice it. We get on a bus. Something happens. God is trying to teach us something. We bump into somebody and God is trying to talk to us through just so many things. So first we have to have a listening heart and mind, always open to God, and then the ear to hear what he's saying with the things that we see. As we sit in this room, we might read something or look at something and God could speak to us just naturally like that. Say, did you notice that? And then you you start to hear the voice of God. Just because he's not here, it doesn't mean he can't speak to us. He's not limited in that way. In fact, he said, it's better that I leave Because while I'm here, I speak to you face to face, but up there, I can speak to billions of you all at once through the power of the Holy Spirit. One day, Jesus was walking in the field, do you remember? And he was going through the field and uh, it was covered with flowers. So he just stopped for a minute to bring a teaching. It's found in Matthew 6, 25 and 28. It says this. It says, don't worry about your life, he says. What you will eat or drink or about your body, what you will wear. And why do you worry about clothes? He said, see. He says, see, you see. See, look, he says. See, see the field. See the flowers in the field. See, he says, how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith. Taking every opportunity, you see. He could turn any situation, anything, focus their eyes on it and start to teach. He wants to do that now to us. Just because he's not here, he still wants to do that. And so we have to be people who listen, who tune ourselves in to what God is wanting to say to us continually. Also, another way in which God speaks to us, he speaks to us through other people, gets them to say something, or they say something and he prompts us to listen carefully to what they say. Maybe they're just talking and then they may you just use a word or one phrase or a sentence and that seems to stand out over all the other 
phrases and sentences. You go, that's funny. That's funny that they should say that. Maybe you're asking a question here, and they bring up the very same question when you're talking to them with an answer. And you go, God, it's amazing that they can do that. See, we have to be listening. So God speaks then through other people. There's a wonderful example of that in Acts chapter 9. In Acts 9, we read about the Apostle Saul's conversion. He's on his way to Damascus, and um, uh, he's got letters from the priest, and he's going to deal with the Christians that are there, throw them into prison. He wants to destroy the, the, the way that this new church, this new sect that's coming up, he, he's really anti anything to do with Jesus, opposed to him. On his way to Damascus, of course, Jesus says something to him. It's quite a dramatic encounter, isn't it? He, he strikes him and he's blinded by the light and he asks him, what does he think he's doing? He's striking against the Lord and he, he doesn't realise. And he says, well, who are you then, Lord? And he says, I am the Christ, the Jesus that you are so opposed to. Then the voice tells him to go to Damascus and there wait and someone will come and see him. Paul will now discover that God wants to speak through other people. If God said all that to him on the road, why didn't he talk to him in Damascus? Why bother stirring up this other disciple, uh, Ananias, wasn't it? God speaks to Ananias. He speaks to him in a dream, a vision, it says. So we don't know whether he was asleep, having an afternoon nap, or we don't know whether it was the night, or we don't know whether it was an open vision. It's hard to know the difference. But he speaks to Ananias very clearly. It wasn't just a, a notion and an idea. He says, I want you to go to such and such a place. There you will meet such and such a person, and you'll do this thing. Lay your hands on him. He's blind. He will then receive his sight and you can share the things of God with him. It's funny, in this dream, he answers back all this vision. You have had a dream and answered back in the dream. You can speak in dreams, can't you? I don't know whether you always get answers, but I mean, you can. Um, he, I got an idea this was like an open vision. I'm going to settle for that anyway. Not more than a dream. And so he says to him, well, I know this man you're going to send me to, Paul. He's a dangerous character. He's after the Christians, you know. Do you think I'm just going to turn up like that and pray for the man? And, and Jesus says, don't worry. You'll be all right. You'll be safe. I'll look after you. No need to worry. And by the way, he's expecting you. Apparently, Paul also got a vision of this man called Ananias coming to him to do the very thing that he told Ananias to do. God was good when he just set them both up. And now we see Ananias. He turns up at the house and uh, he does what God tells him to do. We tend to say that he prayed for him to get his sight back. It doesn't say that, does it? And it's not what Jesus told him to do. Jesus said, put your hands on him. Just lay your hands on him and his sight will come back. So I think Ananias just did that. He just laid his hands on him. I thought for a long time we should do what the Bible says. It says, lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. We, we attempt this funny prayer, don't we? As though we're trying to persuade God to do something, convince ourselves we've got some faith, encourage the person who's sick. Whatever reason we say these words, I'm not quite sure. Lay hands on the sick, it says. That's probably sufficient if that's what... Jesus told us to do. The power that abides within us, rests in us, can simply flow from us into the bodies of the other people. Now, there's nothing wrong in praying for the sick. I haven't suggested that for one minute. I'm just saying, maybe it's not necessary. Maybe if there's an anointing on us, it simply flows as we lay hands on the sick. Why did God then involve Ananias in all of this? What was the point God, he wants to do everything in partnership with us. 
usually if you've received anything from the Lord, you've received it from somebody. Maybe the salvation that you receive came through someone's testimony or a preacher or you read something or a friend just told you. See, God used them in the process of your salvation, in the process of healing or deliverance or, or receiving truth and understanding. God chooses to work through people. He's in partnership with us. But it's more than a partnership. He's in a loving relationship with all of us. So why wouldn't he want to talk to us? In fact, if he wants us to do all this stuff, he's got to talk to us, hasn't he? How would we know what to do? He's got to talk. He's set it up so he has to talk. He has to. And we have to listen. Otherwise, if we can't listen and hear, we can't live the Christian life. We must hear, we must hear, and as the Spirit speaks to us, the Spirit moves us by the very words that he says. Remember that verse where it says these, these godly men of old, they wrote the scriptures, but it didn't come from their mind and intellect, it came from God carrying them along by the Spirit. The sense that God is speaking to us. God is, and through his words, he moves us into action. He spoke to Ananias, and Ananias got up and he moved, and he did this tremendous thing, and he brought revelation to Paul, and he opened his eyes so he was no longer blind, and he set him on a course. You know what it says about Ananias? He was a disciple. Oh, I love that. He wasn't an apostle. He wasn't anybody special. He was just a disciple. God wants to talk to all of us because he wants partnership with us and he loves us. If you had a partner in business, you'd have to talk to them, surely. Otherwise, the business wouldn't go anywhere. And if you love somebody, surely you would talk to them. Otherwise, that relationship would go nowhere either. This requires then for God to continually speak to us. And I mean continually, day after day. And the more we hear, the deeper the relationship, the deeper the love, the stronger the partnership between us and him. We have to practice. My sheep know my voice. We practice and practice and put ourselves into a place. This, I think, because he loves us and wants a partnership with us, should cause us to be listeners to the voice of God. God speaks through the scriptures. This has long been considered the primary way God speaks to his people. God spoke initially through the Spirit to people. There's a certain wing of the church that were quite happy when the Bible came along because they could discard the Spirit and hang on to the book, you see. We don't need the Spirit anymore. We don't need prophecy or tongue or interpretation. We don't need the gifts of the Spirit. We don't need that because now we have the book. If you want to know anything, just open the book. This is how God speaks to us. It was 1,500 years after Christ before ordinary Christians had the book because there were no printing presses until about the 1500s. The only Bible that you would have seen, you would have gone to the church and it would have been chained to the pulpit and probably in some churches it was only in Latin anyway and you had no chance and others you probably couldn't read anyway, or your reading was very limited. See, God's primary way of communication, even after we had the scriptures, was by the Spirit of God. The sons of God are not led by the Bible. The sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. Of course, the Spirit of God is not contrary to the Bible, in no way. The, the one who wrote this is the Spirit of God who speaks to us. So he doesn't say one thing and then write another thing in the book. But the primary way that people have said that we should hear the voice of God is through the Scriptures. You can understand now why there's that 
slight bias towards that. I'm not against that. God has spoken many, 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 many times to me from his word. But he also wants to speak by his spirit. We'd be wrong to limit God only to speaking from his word. God is a lot broader than that in the way that he wishes to communicate. As we grow, you see, in our relationship with God, we will know his voice the same way that Jesus knew his father's voice. As a boy, he had trained himself in the scriptures. As a boy, he lived a devout life. He focused his attention on his father. And then it became instinctive in his heart to know the will of the Father. He knew it. That's what God requires of us, that we know instinctively what we should do. Of course, if we knew the word of God better than we do know it, to whatever degree that you know it, I'm not challenging how much you know it, if you knew it more, you'd be more confident of knowing the mind and the will and the purpose of God. That's the same for all of us. Mind you what it says in John 5 and 19, he says, I tell you the truth, and you know what he means when he says that. You're not going to believe it, so listen carefully. The son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees the father doing. You see, it's that thing of seeing again. He sees what the father does. He sees it in nation. He sees it in creation. Just like we can see the will of the father through our eyes. He sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. God speaking then through us seeing. And he, there's another verse, uh, a few chapters along in 12 and 49 and 50. He said, for I do not speak of my own accord, but the father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know that his commands lead to eternal life. So whatever I say, is just what the Father has told me to say. The mind, the will of God, is in this book. The more we can consume it and understand it and love it and it become part of us, we too know the mind of Christ. We know his direction. We know what God wants simply through that. I've got just one more for you. It's linked with something I said previously about being led by the Spirit. God speaks directly to us by the Holy Spirit. I want to turn you to a couple of examples, and they're in the, the book of Acts. Um, Acts chapter 10, first of all. Um, as I say, they only had the Old Testament to fall back on in the early church, and uh, they were really, really dependent on uh, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and I think we should be more dependent on it as well like they were. In Acts chapter 10, then, we read the account of Cornelius. Cornelius was a Gentile. He was in the army. He appreciated there was one God, and he worshipped this God, but he knew nothing about him really, and uh, he wasn't Jewish, that's where he would have found out about this one God, and God had obviously drawn him to himself, uh, but there was a disconnect because he wasn't Jewish, and he wasn't born again, and he wanted this connection. And we know that an angel appears to him and speaks to him quite clearly and says, I want you to get hold of the apostle Peter when he's close by, and get him to come and talk to you and to all your family. Peter at this time, along with most of the other early church members, they believe that when Christ came, he came to be the Messiah only of the Jews and not of the Gentiles. So they would never have gone to the Gentiles because the Gentiles weren't to receive the Messiah, only the Jews were meant to receive the Messiah. That's what they thought. It took them about 10 years for their thinking to be converted. And we see that this is the principal way that uh, it's converted. Remember the story, I'm sure you do, how he goes to his friend who's living by the sea at Joppa and uh, he's hungry, he goes onto the roof and he's having a little nap before his lunch. 
and he goes into the word, the NIV uses the word trance. I don't like using that word. Uh, I think it can be confusing if to say went into a trance. You think, oh, uh, you know, something weird. Uh, I wish they'd used the word, uh, it went into a dream or he had a vision, an open vision. I believe it to be something more like that. And of course, he sees this sheet coming down and all these animals on the sheet and then the voice, and he knows it's the voice of the Lord, says, get up, Peter, kill and eat. And there's all these unclean animals. And he says, oh, I couldn't do that. And then he says, him, tells him three times uh, to do it. <laughs> that repetition of three times, that's encouraging, isn't it? If you're a bit dim or a bit slow and you're not sure, God's quite prepared to repeat himself and repeat himself and repeat himself again. And I think by the third time, you should have got it. You know what I mean? And he's quite, he does that many, many times, like he called the little boy, didn't he, Samuel, three times. And he calls to Peter here three times. And then uh, Peter, he hasn't got a clue what God's talking about. He still hasn't, he doesn't understand it. He says here, while Peter was wondering, this is in 10 and 17, wondering about the meaning of the vision. He didn't know. Well, we always know with hindsight what God's talking about from the scriptures, but he didn't. The men sent, uh, by, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. I always think of them standing at a garden gate because it was nothing like that at all. Was it? Like, you know, down the end of the garden shouting out because that's with our European or British minds, you know. Um, Simon at the house stopped at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, he still, he still ain't got a clue what's going on here. I don't know what all this sheets and clean, unclean, kill things. What are you driving there? Um, a vision. The Spirit said to him, now this is clear, the Spirit just didn't nudge him or hint or point him in a direction. The Spirit spoke clearly to him, almost in audible words. Simon, three men are looking for you. It was the same way that he, uh, Ananias got the message, wasn't it? So precise, so definite. Uh, looking for you. Get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent you. As I read this, it sounded like a mother telling a lazy boy sleeping in his room to get up, get downstairs and get out and do something useful. I'm not saying that wasn't, you know, just it struck me in that same language, you know, don't go back on the roof, Peter, and sleep again before lunch. Get down and get out. So I don't know if he missed his dinner or not. I'm not sure. Anyway, he's, he's obedient, of course. But the Spirit of God speaks clearly, you see. We have to hear. Peter heard. And because Peter heard that day, the whole Gentile world was open to the gospel. What a tremendous change it makes. See, if we hear the voice of God and we act on it, you don't know what doors are going to be opened simply by doing it. And what did he do? He went along with these guys and he did something he'd done hundreds of times before. He simply shared the gospel of Jesus Christ. He simply told them about Jesus coming and dying and so forth. And it says, then the whole house were filled with the Holy Spirit. They spoke in other tongues. And then the other disciples said, they have received the same thing that we have received. Their hearts must be cleansed by the blood to have received the Holy Spirit. So God is saving the Gentiles, shock, horror. Okay, they heard the voice. There's a similar thing a couple of chapters later. This is uh, chapter 13. It's talk about the early church and they need to hear the voice of God. They want to hear God speak. So it says this uh, from verse 1 of chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menion, uh, who had been brought up in, with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord, and, sorry, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them. So he spoke again really clearly, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them, 
So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. Now it goes on to say, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. He seems to be the voice of God, the speaker of God, the activator of God, the one who who moves us as he speaks. See, if we don't hear the voice of God, we won't move. We won't move. We can't move. Because it is the voice of God, the spirit of God that moves us. Not to hear what God is saying and to feel the impress to be carried along by the spirit we do nothing. We simply live. Someone like this being moved by the Spirit as a sailing ship, you know, it's full of cargo, full of potential to go anywhere in the world, but if there's no wind, it doesn't go anywhere. It just stays put in harbour. Of course, they're looking all the time to see what the weather forecast is saying, and as soon as the wind comes, It is the power of God, like the Spirit, that moves that ship into a complete new world with more prospects and opportunities, creating wealth or whatever it's going to do. The Spirit then has to move. Without the voice of God speaking, without us hearing, we will never move in the direction of which he's called us. We must hear the voice of God in our lives. Okay, thank you. Okay, in this particular section, what I want to deal with is the importance of repentance. Uh, In prayer, uh, we must always have this attitude of approaching God with a heart of repentance. Uh, Repentance some people think repentance is saying sorry and then carrying on. But of course, God's not interested in sorry. He's interested in a change of heart. If we say sorry, he thinks you're just a polite person who's had a change of heart. If you don't say sorry, then that's not the big issue. The big issue is, are you going to change and move in a new direction? So we need to get that firm in our mind. Repentance is not about saying sorry for the sins that you've committed. It's about turning and moving in a new direction. Previously, uh, we studied the book of Daniel, so I'm going to take you back uh, to some of that, those of you that have, uh, were in the course with us when we did it. Just a brief reminder, The book of Daniel comprises of 12 chapters. The first six chapters are a collection of stories about Daniel and his three friends, narratives. Um, What they want to do is emphasise the faithfulness of God's people in very difficult and testing times. Daniel and his three friends were captives in Babylon. Daniel spent all his life in Babylon a captive. And uh, he went through many difficult trials and testings. And the strength that we can draw from it, the encouragement, is that we live in an alien world. We shouldn't be too comfortable in this world, by the way. Uh, We try to make ourselves as comfortable as possible, but this is really ruled over by alien spirits. And um, if we're really for God, we would feel somewhat uncomfortable in this world, just as Daniel and his friends they were uncomfortable, but they, were, they learned how to live in captivity, how to live under an oppressive regime, and how to represent God. So they can teach us those things. In chapter, well, like I said, the first six chapters were about these narratives, these stories. The next six chapters, 7 to 12, they deal with three visions that Daniel has. Uh, visions about the future of Israel, the future of the world and the coming of Christ. Uh, These are visions that he has. In chapter 9, after the, I think it's after the second vision that he gets, Daniel is called by God to pray, to pray in a certain way in the midst of the visions. It's a vital prayer. He has to pray this prayer. If not, the future plans of God cannot be unfolded, as it were. They can't proceed forward. So it's vital that he prays this prayer. 
It's this prayer I want to consider now. Um, I shall be in Daniel chapter 9, so if you want to follow it through with me, and I'll probably end up reading great chunks of it just to make the point to you. Let's put this whole chapter then of Daniel 9 uh, into perspective. Daniel 9 is very interesting. It's a, it's a prayer of repentance, basically. If you want to read the other prayer of repentance in the Old Testament that's longer than this one, you go to Nehemiah 9. It's easy to remember. That's even longer. Uh, and so they're both classic prayers to teach us about how to pray in this particular way. As I said, is Daniel and his three friends were taken into captivity in Babylon, and uh, Daniel knows what the, the prophets are saying. He knows what they've written down. And one of the prophets at this time is a man called Jeremiah. Jeremiah has prophesied that uh, Israel will be in captivity for 70 years. They're being punished for something they haven't done that God has called them to do. And then after 70 years, God will send them back to Israel to build up Jerusalem, the city of God again. As I said, Daniel has spent all his life in captivity. When he prays this prayer in chapter 9, he's about 85 years old. So he's lived a long time, from probably the age of 15 when he was taken into captivity. So he's lived a long, long time with the Babylonian people. Daniel, though, he knows Jeremiah's prophecy that God's people will soon be released to go back to their homeland. Daniel then, chapter 9. Daniel is prompted by God to pray. Have you ever been prompted to pray? You feel an impress of the Spirit that if you don't do this, it's not going to work out well for you at all. We must pray about things. When I say pray, that doesn't mean go down on your hands and knees by the side of your bed necessarily, but it's to fellowship and communicate with God, to relate to God. Um, someone once wrote a book called uh, Living in the Fast Lane. In other words, their lives were so busy, they just snatched prayer, you know, but they snatched it many, many times through the day, as it were, and of course it enabled them. The fact that we are communicating uh, is vital. The first couple of verses then of this says this. In the first year of Darius, the son of Exerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of Jerusalem would last for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and I pleaded with him in prayer and I petitioned in fasting, in sackcloth and in ashes. <laughs> You're thinking, if God has said he's going to do this, why is he bothering pleading? If God said, I'm going to do something, would you bother pleading with God? You just think, oh, that's good. God's going to do this. No, no, it doesn't mean this at all. And then... I'll stop there. I'll stop at different sections and then talk a little bit in between. So it was Daniel that was prompting him to pray. We see from these first early verses here. He had read the scriptures. He knew that it was time for God to move and send the people back. But he knew there was a necessity for this to happen, that he had to pray. Pray and fast. Uh, it talks about sackcloth and ashes come humbly, contrite before his God. It was the Spirit of God that drew him to prayer. It was the Spirit of God that showed him what to pray and the Spirit of God that showed him how to pray. Remember the disciples coming to Jesus as we looked at the beginning. Lord, teach us how to pray. Do we really know anything? And we definitely don't know anything spiritual unless someone teaches us, someone shows us the way. And so we have these precious scriptures to teach us. There's a few things that strikes me real odd about this. In his prayer, he repents for all the sins he's never committed. That's a bit odd. Why would you bother doing that? 
the second thing is the thing I've already mentioned. God's already determined what he's going to do. He's put it in the book of the prophets. Jeremiah has prophesied it in the name of the Lord. It's got to happen, isn't it? So why is he bothering to pray at all? Why is it a need if God has declared this thing is going to happen? And apparently, one man praying for the sins of tens of thousands of people, because it is the sins of Israel, tens of thousands of people, one man prays, and God hears and answers the prayer. Now, you say, there might have been other people praying. I don't know if they were. We don't know that. But the inference is it only takes one to, to activate, as it were, the very processes of God in dealing with a whole nation of people. And God's desire to bless, and this is true in all of our lives, is only dependent upon our repentance. The Christians think they can do anything and pray and God will do it. He won't. He won't do that because we're covenant people and God has set down in the covenant what's necessary for God to bless us. And if we don't do it, we can't expect the blessing. Now God could override his covenant, but he doesn't usually do that. He's written it down, he's explained it to us. He says, you do this and I'll do that. If you don't do this, I won't do that. And somehow we think, oh, we live in this wonderful age of grace and it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> it does matter. And we're going to see from this particular passage that it really does. So there are three parts then to the prayer, the whole of chapter 9, from verses 4 down to 19. The first part is his confession. He confesses all of the sins of the nation, but he puts himself in the frame although he's never really committed any of these sins. In fact, he couldn't have living where he lived. It was the sins of the generations before. In fact, it was the sins of the people of 490 years before. That's why they were in captivity for 70 years. It was one year for every seven that they didn't do what they were supposed to do, which adds up to the 70 years. Uh, the second part is to agree with God. To agree with God in every way. That his judgment of them was fair and right. Repentance is about you coming into agreement with God. You need to know what God thinks about something before you pray. And it's coming into an agreement with him. The third section, uh, the last five verses, is his prayer of repentance. So let's have a look at this first section uh, from verses 4 uh, down to halfway through verse 11. It's a, the part of the confession of the prayer of repentance. Daniel is praying for the salvation of his nation. He is standing in the gap. And that means he identifies with his nation's sin. Remember that verse that says, I look for somebody to stand in the gap but I found nobody. Well, he was talking primarily about Jesus standing in the gap. But there is a sense that God is always looking for someone to stand in the gap. Someone to represent a group of people, a church, a nation, a community, someone who God has called to stand in the gap and petition and repent on behalf of all the others. Because all these others are not going to repent. But God wants to bless them. God wanted to bless Israel, but without repentance, he could not bless them. It is as though God's hands were tied in this area of blessing. Daniel had done none of the things that he was going to repent for. He had been faithful and obedient to God all the time. This is how he prays. I pray to the Lord my God, and I confessed, he says, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with all who love him and obey his commands. Notice he sets down the first thing. This is a covenant God. It's not you're going to do this because you're nice and we're weak. He says we are in covenant, you and me. You said you would do something and I said I would do something. So I'm coming to you on the basis of covenant. We go to God on the basis of the covenant that was being cut with us by Jesus Christ and his blood has sealed the covenant. We have sinned and we have done wrong. We have been wicked and we have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. 
We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes and our fathers and to all the people of the land. Lord, you are righteous, but this day we are covered with shame. The men of Judah, the people of Jerusalem and all of Israel, both near and far, in all the countries where you have scattered them, uh, scattered us because of our unfaithfulness to you. O Lord, we and our kings and our princes and our fathers are covered with shame because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiven. Even though we have rebelled against him, we have not obeyed the Lord our God or kept the laws he gave us through his servant, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your laws and turned away from refusing to obey you. Oh Lord, I did this, but you know why I did it. I didn't mean to do it. None of that nonsense. We are ashamed. We are a disgrace. We have broken the covenant. He's openly confessing his rebellion, or not his really, the rebellion of his people. But notice what he says. He says, we have done this. So he identifies himself with the nation. He is speaking on behalf of every one of them and identifies himself with them. We have sinned. We have done wrong. We have been wicked. We have rebelled. We have turned away from your laws. We have not listened to your prophets and we have turned away refusing to obey you. We have broken the covenant, he says. So you have removed your blessing from us. God can do nothing else. When we break the covenant, there isn't a blessing from the Lord. You can ask him for it, but that's not the issue. The issue is you get back into covenant. Whatever you're doing that's broken the covenant, get back into covenant. Part two is Daniel's agreeing that God is just and fair and right from verse 11, or the second part, down to 14. Therefore, the curses and sworn judgments written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against you. You have fulfilled the word spoken against us and against our rulers by bringing upon us great disasters. Under the whole heavens, nothing has even been done like what has been done to Jerusalem. Just as it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, yet we have not sought the favour of the Lord our God by turning from our sins and giving attention to your truth. The Lord did not hesitate to bring the disaster upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in everything he does, yet we have not obeyed him. See, unfortunately, if God has said it, it's got to happen. Oh, we want him to say and do all the good things, but when it's the other stuff, we freeze and say, no, God, be merciful to me. Well, okay. The third section then is uh, to do with repentance now. So it's Daniel 9, 15 to 19. Now the Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and who made for yourselves a name that endures to this day. They always do this. They bring the wonderful thing that God has done and the most wonderful thing that God ever did was deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he comes now to God. He is going to plead his case. He is going to come before God in his repentance, but he is going to remind God of how gracious and wonderful and merciful and delivering he is who made for yourself a name to endure to this day. We have sinned and we have done wrong. O Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city. Notice it says it's your city. It's yours, God. I don't want you to deliver me because of me. I don't want you to save Jerusalem because of the people of Jerusalem. It's because of you. Our prayers must be first for the honour and glory of God. Lord, I want you to heal my body. Why? Oh, because I feel so bad and weak and sick and poor and miserable. No, I want you to heal my body. Yes, for all those reasons too, I understand that. But Lord, I want you to heal so you will be glorified when I testify to what you have done. See, if we pray and we're in the centre of our prayer, there's something really wrong with it. 
God has got to be in the centre. If I live or die, it's for the glory of God. If I'm sick or well, it is for the glory of God. God, we want you to do things so that you are glorified. Lord, in keeping with all your righteous acts, turn away your anger and your wrath from Jerusalem, your city, your holy hill. Our sins and our iniquities of our fathers have made Jerusalem and your people an object of scorn. See, we have made you, God, a laughing stock by the way that we have acted. My prayer, I acknowledge we are a mess, but turn it around so that you might be glorified. Now, our God, hear the prayers and the petitions of your servants. For whose sake? For your sake, O Lord. Look with favour on your desolate sanctuary. It's your desolate sanctuary, it's not ours. It's wonderful, isn't it, the way he puts it here. Give ear, O God, and hear. Open your eyes and see the desolation of the city that bears your name. We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy, O Lord. Listen, Lord. Forgive, O Lord. Hear and act for your sake, O my God. Do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. We got it? <laughs> he pounds that point home. We've got to change our prayers so they become God-centred. So much of our prayers can be, bless me, bless me, help me, bless me. That's fine when we're new Christians, but a time has got to come when we are on this edge or the side and God is in the middle and our prayers are about him and not about us. We're not there in an instant. It takes time. I realise that. Repentance appears to be a prerequisite of the blessing of God, which he was doing here. He knew this from what was written by Moses in Deuteronomy 30. Moses wrote this, Deuteronomy 30, 2 and 3. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God, and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. God will do this. If we repent, put God in the centre, he will bless it is a covenant promise of God. God is watching over his word to perform it. We don't have to convince him. We simply have to walk in the covenant. Salvation then in the grace of God does not mean we can live just as we please and God will bless us whatever we do. No, he won't. We've studied covenants as well, haven't we? And we learned this in the covenants. The covenants apply today as much as they did in the time of Moses. It's just we've got a better covenant, but it's still a covenant. And it isn't one-sided. It's equal for both of us to uphold each part of it. God is still a covenant God and we're still his covenant people. If the church in the UK has broken covenant with God, God cannot bless the church in the UK. Now you have to think, as the church, as the church moved away from what it should be, as it become a place where people go to get blessed all the time, or do they gather there to glorify God? If we go there for blessing and the church meets for blessing, then we've moved away from the covenant. The church is there for God. Listen to sermons and people's prayers and determine what are they praying about? What are they speaking about? Is it about the glorification of God or the blessing of man? We have to, we have to ask these questions. I think the church gets what it deserves. If the church goes through hard times, it's because it deserves hard times, because it has moved away from the covenant of God. 
If personally we've broken covenant with God, well, we need to get back into covenant, whatever it is. I'm sure it's not a, if there is something. But God can't bless us, you see, if we're not in covenant. He can't do it. He would be a liar, and he won't lie for anyone. And he's ready to tell us if we've broken covenant. He'll show us. That's the work of the Spirit, to guide us and bring us into all truth. We must ask the questions, though, sometimes. We don't want to know if there's something wrong. The scripture teaches us also the principle in the New Testament, doesn't he? In Acts 3 and 19, remember when Peter got up on the day of Pentecost and he began to preach to the people and he had pointed out that it was you same people that crucified this Christ who is the Messiah, the God. And he said to them, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. He said, yeah, you have done this awful thing, but all you have to do is turn around in your thinking, acknowledge Christ for who he was, and not just think of him as a man or whatever drove you to crucify this one. Turn in your thinking, repent, and God will bring blessing after blessing upon your life. There will be times of refreshing, it says, from the Lord. We turn to the book of Revelation, and we get a similar thing, don't we? Where John, the angel has spoken to John, and he's writing letters to the seven churches, of which five of them have slipped away from the commitment that they first made to Christ. He writes to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2 4 and 5. You have forsaken your first love, he says. Repent. Repent. If you've moved away from your first love of God, that's why you're not blessed. Repent. In Revelation 2.14, speaking to Pergamon, he says, you have people there who hold to false teaching. Repent. Turn away from this. I can't bless you. Revelation 2.20 to the church at Thyatira, he says, uh, you tolerate that woman Jezebel in your midst. Repent. Revelation 3, one, talking to the church of Sardis. He says, you're dead. Well, he didn't mean they were dead dead. He meant they were asleep to God. Uh, life was just going on and they were asleep. He said, wake up. Wake up, O oh sleeper. Come on, wake up. Repent, wake up. And finally to the church in Laodicea. Rich church. Revelation 3.15. He says, you make me sick. You're neither hot nor cold. You're so indifferent to the things of God. You're so insipid, really. I don't know if I've got a hot drink or a cold drink when I swallow you. You're just horrible. I want hot or cold. I don't want a hot drink cold and cold drink hot. I need to have you red hot or freezing cold, one or the other. Come on. And so he says, repent, turn around, rethink, because I can't bless you unless you do. See, when we do repent... When we turn in our thinking, he releases the blessing. It's, it's so funny to say God's hands are tied, but he tied them himself. He, no one else tied him. He said, I'll tie my hands. If you walk in covenant, it releases them to do what I want to do. Times of refreshing, he says, will come from the Lord. In our individual lives and in the life of the church and in the life of our nation, we stand, you see. We stand in the gap of our own lives between us and God. And in the, the life of our church and our nation, and even in the world. You're <laughs> getting a bit silly now, Philip. No. God called one man to pray for the whole nation, and it was enough to fulfill the prophecy that he spoke about and bring it into a reality. Daniel stood in the gap and prayed. Is God calling you? He calls all of us, you see. He calls many, but few respond. Prayer is not easy. It's difficult. It's hard. But without it, there are no results. I want to share my own personal testimony. Um, at the beginning of the year, I came into, brought into leadership of a church along with other leaders. I'm not the pastor there or anything, uh, but they're looking to me to bring some direction towards their church. The church is old in 
age and also it's been going for about 70 years. So the passion and the enthusiasm that was there has sort of waned over the years and the numbers have dropped to probably in their 20s or something like that. And some of them said, Phil, will you step into leadership? Because unless something happens, well, th these particular gr group of people were going to leave because they could see no end. They could just see the thing was dying, really. And um, so they said, would you step in and help it? So I, I, th I thought and prayed about it. And uh, I don't know if this is the right answer. I was doing nothing else. <laughs> so, no, I really felt and impressed that I had a commitment to these people. I'd been visiting them for many, many years and I'd built up a relationship with them. And uh, the thought was, well, of course I will. I'll step in and bring what, uh, you know, I can bring to the whole situation. The first thing, the only thing really I've asked them to do is to meet together and pray. We have been meeting for about five years on a Tuesday evening doing Bible studies and bringing a Bible study similar to what I bring here. I decided I would only do half a study and we would do half prayer. And so that started uh, at the beginning of this year. Uh, last Sunday uh, it was so exciting because uh, we sit like in most churches and you face the front and about 5 to 11, when the service starts, you look around and there's six people. You know exactly what I'm talking about? And then um, you look around when, the, when they start and you think, oh, there's a few more. Because then when you get up to speak and you see the congregation, there were 40 people there Sunday. It was like revival has come here. There's no reason for those people to come. The church is just the same. It's aging, it's rather traditional. Um, we have no music. The person who sings, sings from electronic music that's behind her on a screen. She does an excellent job. Um, it's not particularly charismatic. It's in that sense, the people in their heart might be, but they don't voice it like they should. And there's 40 people standing in front of us. God is good, you see. So what have we done? We've turned up and prayed. And we've practiced doing it and doing it and doing it. I tell you, when you go to a prayer meeting, you always feel out of your depth. Of course, because you're standing to talk to the Almighty. Of course you're going to feel out of your depth. You go home and you're thinking, what on earth was that all about? Did we achieve anything? Did anything happen there? And, and I'm thinking, what are we supposed to say? What are we supposed to do? There might be 12 of us in the room and six people don't say anything. And then you get frustrated with the people that don't you pray. But you know, God spoke to me and said, listen, it's nothing to do with them praying. They've turned up. They know what this is for. They presented their bodies as a living sacrifice. If they never pray ever, they've turned up before the throne of God and their very actions are saying, God, we're here because we want you to turn something around. Do something in the midst of us. We are old and we can't do anything. And God is doing it. He's doing it. I hope I can come back in months and years and say God has brought hundreds to this place. I don't know. God has his plans and purposes. But see, God is turning things around. I pray everything I teach on. There, one week I'm repenting, the next week I'm reading this verse out, then I'm pleading with God to do something, then I'm petitioning him, then I'm confessing for our sins and the sins of the nation and the sins of the church. Just give it to him. You don't have to get the words perfect, you know. He reads the heart more than anything else. He knows how sincere I am and these other people are. And it's, it's causing God to turn we're loosening his hands and now he can gather the people in. Did you notice in that prayer? He said, gather the people from all the nations and bring them back. I'm excited. Putting into practice the things that God has promised in his word. If we don't, we tie the hands of God. 